So the two people that I invited, um, one is Edward Lukasek, and um, Edward's uh, book collection, the Edward Lukasek Gay Studies Collection, actually makes up a large chunk, is probably the backbone of the exhibit. And in fact, the exhibit um, was conceived of partly to show off um, this wonderful collection. Um, Edward has been a catalog librarian in the Hirsch Library at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston since 2006. But before that, he worked here in special collections at the UH Libraries, where he processed archival collections related to music and the performing arts. Edward also coordinated the Poetry and Prose Reading series from 2001 to 2006. Before moving to Houston with his longtime partner, Robert Bates, professor of organ here at the Moore School of Music, Edward was in the wine business in San Francisco, where he managed a wine shop in the heart of the Castro District for 17 years. It was during that time that his gentle madness, and that's a term used for book collecting, uh, led to collecting the books that are now the foundation of the Edward Lucasette Gay Studies Collection. Before that, Edward and Robert lived in Paris, where Robert was studying organ performance at the Conservatoire de Rule Malmaison, while Edward was studying wine at the Academy du Vin. Um, and I'm very happy to have Edward back in the department um, to talk about his collection and his life with books. Nice to be here. Uh, Natalie Houston is an associate professor in the English department here at the University of Houston, where she's taught since 1998. Her primary research interests are Victorian poetry and the application of digital humanities tools to the study of literary production. Her current project, Digital Reading, Poetry and the New 19th Century Archive, uses large-scale computational analysis to explore the cultural function of poetry within Victorian print culture. In addition to teaching undergraduate and graduate courses on Victorian poetry, Victorian fiction, and literary theory, Natalie has taught several courses on gay and lesbian literature. She shares her life with her partner, Bunny Watts, and their three dogs. Well, Natalie. Thank you. Um, so both of you are very booky people, I think it's safe to say. <laughs> that's, that's really why you're here. Um, so I want to ask Edward first, um, were you a serious reader as a child? And what was your relationship like to books when you were growing up? And I remember the first like, great book was in eighth grade when I picked up, I'm sure it was a condensed version of Moby Dick by Melville, and I thought, wow, this is, you know, I would like to be on that boat. <laughs> <laughs> and I just felt also that it was all guys on the boat. <laughs> I don't know. It's just something in the back of my mind just, I just picked up on it. I had no idea, you know, anything about Melville or anything. It just, it's just one of those books, and I remember it like yesterday. How about you, Natalie? I was sure. an avid reader. Yeah, that I was, not I was that kid who was always carrying a book around, <laughs> you know. Um, there's a kind of reading you do, or uh, that I did as a kid, that kind of like just intense absorption in a book, and you do nothing else on Saturday morning for like three hours, you're just reading this book. Um, which is hard, you know, as an adult, you're like, your life gets much more complicated and you have more things to read. And, but that, you know, I, I vividly remember that experience of reading as a child. And I got my first library card when I was four. My favorite babysitter took me to get a library card. My parents hadn't thought of it. Um, and, and that was tremendously exciting. Like, here was this place full of books, everything you could imagine, you know. And so I've always associated libraries with freedom and exploration. And uh, so yeah, I'm, I've been a reader my whole life. Fantastic. What kinds of representations of gays, lesbians, or other LGBTQI people um, were you seeing? Or, or what were you learning in, in school or other settings? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nothing. Um, Basically, um, when I was growing up, I n noticed guys more than I not noticed girls, and and there were TV shows like American Bandstand and 
the Mickey Mouse Club and all this kind of stuff. And I, <clears throat> I would go back to grade school and talk to my buddies that I hung around with, and I'd say, did you see the new guy that, that started on, on the American Bandstand? And they, they'd say, no, did you see that new girl? <laughs> And so then I was like, hmm, we're not communicating. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there was really nothing. Um, back then, of course, you know, and then being in the Catholic church and the Catholic schools and everything, it, it was, you know, it was a sin and it was against the law. You know, it was just a really, in fact, my, my mother used to, get all these magazines and Life magazine was one of the you know that we got all the time and I this particular one came out in June 26 1964 so I was 14 years old and it was an article on homosexuality in America and it was this big expose and I read it and it, well this is this is what it said a secret world grows open and bolder. Society is forced to look at it and try to understand it. And then it's got the picture in this leather bar in San Francisco. I think it's the stud, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> and it says, these brawny young men in their leather caps, shirts, jackets, and pants are practicing homosexuals, men who turn to other men for affection and sexual satisfaction. They are part of what they call the gay world, which is actually a sad and often sordid world. That's the introduction to the article. Oh. So this is the kind of thing when you're 14 years old trying to figure out, gee, where am I headed? And then you see this kind of thing. It, it really pushes you or keeps you in the closet, is what it does, especially for a small town. Um, do you remember um, uh, do you remember the first time you encountered a book that featured like gay content or characters? Um, yes, or actually, but I, it was already, I was already in 10th grade at that point. Mm. And that was a book that came out, I'm not sure it came out that year or before that, but it was called Boys and Girls Together by William Goldman. It's probably, nobody probably knows this book. It's one, it's about this thick. And it's a story of, you know, single people and then, like, and then single boys and girls and then boys and girls together and boys and boys together, girls and girls together. Is it kind of, you work your way through it. And, and that was the first time that I ever read anything that talked about a relationship between two people of the same sex. And this book was being passed around under the table, and it was complete, by the time I got it, it was completely, it was just, the pages were falling out of it, and it was like, here, read this, you know, and so. Um, Natalie, what, uh, what representations do you remember um, when you were growing up of I mean, LGBT? Certainly, it was nothing like it is today in terms of mainstream culture. I mean. Growing up in the 1970s, um, there was certainly more awareness of gay culture because, the, you know, I was I was a child in the post Stonewall era. But it, in terms of books or media that, as a young person, I had access to, I mean, there were certainly no representations. But you know, thinking about um, thinking about you know books that made an impression. I mean. I would say Louisa May Alcott's Little Women was probably one of the first queer books I read. Now, I'm not saying that as a scholar of Alcott in any way, but I think as readers, we make books into what we want them to be. And Josephine March is like the most amazing tomboy, especially in the 19th century. And then there's the boy named Laurie, which was always kind of confusing. And they're kind of interested in each other. And actually, if you read the whole, like, there's a whole series besides Little Women. There's uh, there's Little Men, and then there's, I forget the names of, there's four or five of them. And there's other um, non-traditional women characters in those books, including one who's studying to be a doctor. Again, 
in the middle of the 19th century. That's, I mean, it was clear in the context of those novels that that was a radical choice. And she was very clearly not, she was rejecting all the suitors. She was gonna be a single woman and be a doctor. I was really drawn to books that suggested alternative possibilities for women. I also had a book, and thanks to the miracles of Google, I was able to actually figure out what book this was, because you can, we had scholastic books, I don't, I don't know if that still exists. They would, they would like send the a little leaflet to school mm -hmm. and you could pay your 25 cents or 50 cents and get one of these paperback books from this. And so it was a publishing house. And so you can look up on the internet and people have collected them and you get this whole list of scholastic books from the early 1970s. And the, the one I had in mind was called The Secret Soldier. And it's the story of Deborah Sampson. And it's the story of a woman who cross-dressed as a man and, and was a soldier in the Revolution, American Revolutionary War. And I had that book. And that also made a huge impact just in shaping my sense that um, one didn't have to just grow up and um, follow the standard mold. Um, so those, those books were certainly really important. I think the first book that I could really call a gay book that I remember making an impact um, would be a separate piece by John Knowles, um, which was first published in 1959. And, um, and there's very clearly a passionate love story between the two young boys at school in that book. And I read that, and then I read a lot of other books about boys at boarding school, mostly British. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see too many books about girls at boarding school, but I would just, you know, change things where necessary or whatever. <laughs> it was clear there was, a, there was this possibility of passionate, complicated, interesting, same-sex environments. And that's, so that was something as a reader I was certainly drawn to. Here it is. What is your all-time favorite work of LGBTQI literature? You're asking me. I'm asking you. Well, I have many, so it's really hard to pinpoint. I just finished um, the um, autobiographical, autobiographical trilogy by Edmund White. It started with A Boy's Own Story, and then The Beautiful Room is Empty, and then The Farewell Symph Symphony. And <clears throat> that runs a period of about 30 years in his life, and he's such a great writer that, um, and he's 10 years older than I am, so I'm sort of following him as he's going through this before I did, in a sense, although I'm catching up with him now, but um, he just has such a great prose style, and and, able, and he, he remembers everything, and he just it sort of puts you right back into that period of your life when you were going through the same kind of emotional things. And, and I just finished uh, The Farewell Symphony, which is his, the last of that trilogy, and that took place in the 90s, and that, of course, then represented the horrific um, era of AIDS. And Farewell Symphony actually refers to um, one of Haydn's symphonies where little by little the members of the orchestra walk off stage until finally there's one violinist left to play the final note of the symphony. And that's how he treats it and it's extremely, it's one of those difficult books to read um, because it, well, it puts you right back there. Stunning metaphor, too. Yeah, exactly. For the experience. Um, okay, I'll ask you a question now. I'm an English professor. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot pick one favorite, so I have a couple books I'll mention. Um, because it's the, the question my, was your favorite. My favorite, <laughs> and I cannot pick. Okay. I cannot play favorites. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite contemporary novelists is the um, Irish novelist Emma Donoghue, and her two first novels, um, the first one is a coming out, coming of age story called Stir Fry um, from 1994, and then her second novel, Hood, in 1995, those are both really powerful lesbian, novels of lesbian experience. Um, and, um, and the first one spoke to me, I think, quite a bit when I was young, you know, it's a coming of age sort of story. Um, 
Hood, Hood really lasts. I think it's, it's a much stronger novel. Can I ask when they were written or when she was? Um, this not, first one's 1994, the second one's 1995. She's written a number of great books since then. Um, the most recent one is like the Frog, Frog Music. Frog Music, thank you. Um, she's written a bunch of historical fiction. A whole, she's a fantastic writer and a really inventive writer. Um, so, I, so I definitely list Hood as one of my favorite gay lesbian novels. Um, Michael Cunningham's A Home at the End of the World um, from 1990 um, is also a really um, rich, complex novel about human relationships and all of their texture and complexity and in following a, a trio of, of friends. Um, and and it's, it's Cunningham's a beautiful, lyrical writer also. It's got a lot of very literary qualities. Um, and it's, it's more complicated. It's not just like a, a romance story. It's, it's really, it gets at the texture of human relationships in ways that I think are really interesting. And I'll also mention Carol Ann Shaw's Aquamarine, which is a novel a lot of people haven't heard of, which um, takes the protagonist and gives you different versions of her life. Um, so in one, um, she's married to a man, and in one, she's in a lesbian relationship, and um, it sort of, it plays with questions of identity and life paths in really interesting ways. So those are, those are some of my favorites. <laughs> so, Edward, you were talking about um, the Edmund White book that deals with the 90s and AIDS. Um, but you personally experienced the AIDS crisis um, from its very beginning, from, from the heart of the, the crisis. Um, can you tell us a little about the Castro neighborhood where you lived and had your, your wine shop first? Yeah, I moved um, to San Francisco in 1979 without Robert. Robert was still finishing up his studies and we had kind of a little split and I thought well where am I going to move and I, a friend of mine in Paris I was talking to him and he said I said I want to move to New York you know that's where it's happening and he said are you crazy <laughs> you know you know you're here studying wine move to San Francisco where you know mm -hmm. Napa and Sonoma and you know that's his so I said oh of course <laughs> so anyway when I got there, um, this was the age of the clones. I don't know if anybody in this room knows or heard about that. But it was a period, uh, post-Stonewall period, where men began to assert themselves in hyper-masculine, Im walking images of these hyper-masculine butch guys who wore flannel shirts, blue jeans, boots, and mustache. Marlboro Man. Yeah, Marlboro Man. And chains. And I mean, it was weird <coughs> to me because I'm not, you know, but it was, it was interesting because, you know, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing all this activity and, you know, what does it all mean? Well, that lasted, um, so when I got there in 79 in um, San Francisco was reeling from the Jonestown Massacre, which had happened uh, in November of 78. I moved there in January of 79. And also, at the end of November, uh, Dan White had shot Mira Moscone and, and, Dan, and uh, Harvey, Harvey Milk. And people were in shock, you know, and it was so strange to walk around. And I didn't even really... I found a place to stay way out in 43rd Avenue, which is so far away from downtown and the Castro. But during that time, there was, um, just before Robert moved back, there was the, um, what this thing called the gay cancer. And what we saw were these clones and others walking down the street with these big purple lesions. And, and of course, everybody was absolutely freaked out. No one knew what it was, and you know, is it contagious? And and what had the Castro been like 
sort of before that. And, and then again, things were completely crazy, completely wild, everything, I mean, people just stood around on the streets cruising and anything could, you know, it was just unbelievable. I mean, it was truly unbelievable. Everybody felt so liberated and so free to express themselves and that, you know, this was the, the golden age to be alive. I mean, it sounds like for a gay man, it would have been a fun place oh, to was, live, was... especially considering, you know, the, the kind of prejudice that was going on in other parts well, of the Well, that's country. right. It was, it was literally a ghetto, in a sense. And it was interesting because um, people stood around in, in bars and on the streets and so on. There was actually... Um, a color-coded hanky system that you could put a red hanky here, meaning you're into S and M, or if and you were the sadist, or you wear it in the other pocket and you were the masochist, and then there were all different a rainbow of colors, uh, which all represented something, so that you wouldn't even have to ask the question, "What are you into?" You could see it. Before mobile apps. It's got to be Before Facebook or any of that, all you had to do was just walk around and you could advertise without saying like a word. You were shopping for. Yeah. But actually, um, Robert and I moved to Palo Alto because he got accepted at Stanford. And so I continued to work in the Castro, but actually had the luxury of leaving and going back to Palo Alto in this comfortable Stanford, you know, environment. And so for me, I witnessed a lot of things, but I felt lucky that I wasn't, I was in it, but not 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. you know, and it was, um, it was hard enough to do that. And um, as the epidemic spread and got worse and worse it was it was um, well it just became a nightmare it was um, I worked in a corner building on 19th and Castro and it was um, inside the building there was a clothing store and a cleaners camera shop coffee shop wine shop and then upstairs was a dentist and a hair cutter and a private apartment so it was it was like a half a block long, and things just kept getting worse and worse as far as the spread of this disease and the lack of any kind of government interference or even mentioning the word AIDS. Um, and so um, after 44 people in this building died, I couldn't go to any more memorial services. I mean, I was so much in grief and it was a grief that I couldn't express. The best book that I read about it was actually Heaven's Coast by Mark Doty and I read that when I was, it was like when that came out in the mid 90s I think and his lover Wally had gotten infected and the story, it, and it's so incredible. I learned about it from a colleague that I worked with, didn't know who Mark Doty was in fact, when we were deciding to move to Houston, I, and I discovered that Mark Doty was teaching in the creative writing program here, I almost flipped. I mean, I thought, I can't believe this, because this, this book was the book that if you should read anything at all about how one deals with this horrible situation, then read Heaven's Coast by Mark Doty. Anyway, um, that would be my highest recommendation to, to, to literally experience um, that era. The irony of living in, working in the Castro was um, that there was a uh, thrift store, the community thrift store opened on Valencia Street, which is the Mission District right next to the Castro, and this was a community uh, project that pro the proceeds from the sale of the of this store would go toward feeding people with AIDS and health, you know, kind of um, community support. 
And I, I'm a junk or a thrift store junkie is what they say. And I had always gone into used bookstores and I discovered this place and I couldn't believe the, they had, whoever organized it had it, it was like a very well run library. It was all done. And there was a whole section of gay literature divided into, you know, by, by, you know, genre and it was just absolutely amazing and the prices were incredible and so I kept I go back to that place and then I dawned on me why do they have all these books you know why is this place why do they have and then I realized these were the books of people who had died and these books were given to the thrift to the community thrift store to sell because their family didn't want them or they had no other place to, to get rid of them and so here they are and so ironically and sadly a lot of the books a lot of the first edition books that are in this collection I bought that belong to people who are no longer here tell us about some of the most special books in your collection well, there are a lot of special books. I think um, if you haven't seen the exhibit, go down and look at it. It's it's just the tip of the iceberg, but... Um, and is there over a thousand books in the collection? Yeah. Um, I don't know, the classics, you know, that I was able to find, like Reshi's City of Night, and um, I tried... Uh, we had, on the Castro, on Castro Street, we had uh, a bookstore that moved in in the 90s, I think it was 90, or maybe even before, it was called the Different Light Bookstore. And the Different Light Bookstore was um, um, all gay, and it was organized, and it had events all the time. And so I got to meet people like Michael Cunningham and get him to sign my books and, you know, all kinds of people there all the time and uh, since I worked just a block away it was very easy for me to get there. Um, I'm going to turn to Natalie for a little bit. Um, so you hacked up many years of school on the road to becoming <laughs> a PhD. Um, so I imagine that you had a very heavy reading lists as a um, graduate student in English. Um, did you find time to also read um, lesbian or queer literature, or did you study any um, in graduate school? I certainly read, I mean, I, I read for my work because I'm an academic, but I always have a book for fun reading. Like, for, for me to be happy, I have to have something I'm reading just for fun. What my first grade teacher used to call free reading. Like, when you were done with your worksheets, you got to do free reading, and. Like, I always need that 10 minutes of free reading. Um, so I certainly, you know, read a lot just on my own. Um, and uh, I was really fortunate in graduate school um, to work with Eve Sedgwick um, at, when I was doing my PhD at Duke University. And Eve was um, one of the primary um, scholars and critics um, who created what has come to be known as queer theory. And, um, and I was working with her in the early 90s. Um, and what the, the critical methodology that she introduced and that you know, we studied with her um, offered a way of theorizing sexuality as much more complicated than just a binary of straight and gay. Um, and offered tools for thinking about sexuality critically, looking at literature from earlier periods. Um, and so, you know, our modern ideas about sexual, sexuality and about identity are very much based in, um, you know, culture since about 1870. And if you're looking at any, you know, literature from earlier periods, um, how desire is thought of, how sexuality is thought of, and how identity and gender are thought of are often really, really different from where our standpoint now. And so, um, Working with Eve was a tremendous opportunity to um, to see a lot of, and, and all the people I was in graduate school with, um, a lot of really cutting edge work in theorizing identity, um, and um, 
and in, and in developing the tools for reading sexuality in works from the past when it's not obvious, when it's not right there on the page. We know that there were gay and lesbian people and bisexual people and people of every sort of category that we have today in all the past periods, but how they understood who they were is probably really different from how we understand who we are. Um, and, and Eve Sedgwick also teaches in her works um, about the, con the ways that sexuality and gender and the larger power structures in society are all tangled up together. So that, um, you know, uh, how male homosexuality is viewed as compared to lesbian sexuality in relation to dominant ideas about heterosexual marriage, for instance, um, are often, they're not exactly symmetrical. Um, so, so graduate school, certainly, there was this very intense theoretical work going on around sexuality and identity. Um, and I also did some significant coursework in um, ideas about pedagogies, non, um, you know, pedagogies that would be inclusive of all identity positions. And so thinking about how to um, teach works by writers of color, works by gay and lesbian writers, um, by writers of, of all sorts of different identity positions was also part of that, part of that. I think every course I teach, whether it's science fiction, whether it's women writers, whether it's Victorian literature, um, and then I was, I, I was the first person in the English department to teach a specific special topics course on gay and lesbian uh, literature. That was in 2001. I taught it again in 2003 and 2005, and we now have it as a standard catalog course in the English department, um, and it's taught by a range of different people in the department. Um, and we framed that course so that it can be taught in different ways. Um, so some versions of it I taught, I taught classic gay and lesbian literature, looking at older works before and after Stonewall, and then I've also taught versions of the course that focus on gay and lesbian literature after Stonewall. Um, in 2001, when I first taught that course, it was um, it was really special. The students in that class felt that class to be creating a space for conversations that weren't happening elsewhere on this campus. And thankfully, I think today, I think such courses are still really valuable and important, um, but, you know, the world has changed a lot since 2001. Mm -hmm. um, there are representations of gays and lesbians in literature and in the media in very different ways than there were even just 2001, which doesn't seem that long ago, except when I really do the math. Um, <laughs> right. uh, and so, so that's something I feel really pleased to have um, helped contribute to the course catalog in the English department and um, to the ongoing conversations. We didn't, you know, we didn't have a gay student center at that point. We didn't have the courses that are now in the um, uh, gender and sexuality studies program. I mean, a lot of things have changed on this campus. Two of the books that taught, that really students responded to really well and that I think should be on everyone's list of reading, um, James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room, um, which is from 1956, and Christopher Isherwood's A Single Man from 1964. Both of those are really powerful novels that really speak across the decades, even though we're in a different political time and so forth. Um, there's a kind of uh, emotional depth and political force to those books that really spoke to my students. Um, Michelle T's novel, Valencia, which um, is a kind of post-punk riot girl novel from about 2000, I think, um, about a certain lesbian subculture um, in California. Um, also, it's a, also a kind of rewriting of um, On the Road and, and Beat novels. So there's, um, there's just, just such a range. As a teacher, you can never fit all the books you want to fit onto the syllabus. Like every syllabus, you know, you have to pick like eight books or ten books or eleven if you're really going to make people read fast and they're short. And then there's always like there's always have this other list of like ten or fifteen that I couldn't fit into that semester. And that's a wonderful problem to have. 
there's a tremendous history of gay and lesbian writing. Um, and, and so I fit it into every course I teach. And I think it's important to me to keep teaching the gay and lesbian writers course, but also that we read novels that deal with, um, that are by gay and lesbian writers and that deal with gay and lesbian characters in every course. Um, I read a lot of science fiction when I was young too. I didn't say that earlier, but that was a really important part of my growth as a, as a reader. And because science fiction is a space where identity, you can play with identity in lots of really interesting ways. And so I found, when I was young, I found in science fiction and fantasy writing, people experimenting with different arrangements of gender and sexuality and, and bodies and all the variables of identity um, can be really thought through and experimented with in, in fantastical writing. And so that's, um, that's a really important, you know, that's an area I've been teaching in a lot lately, and, and sexuality is definitely a, a strong component of that course. I think, you know, it's one thing for students to read about the history of literature of, of any sort, and it's another thing for them to be able to go to a, a collection and, you know, explore it in a much more direct way. And I think the value of special collections and, and you know, um, collections like yours that, you know, a collector has assembled, you know, with a particular theme, a focus, um, is that it, um, it makes literature tangible in ways that are really important. And, you know, I use an e-reader, but I'm also a big fan of the book. Like, and to be able to see the cover art, especially yeah. in... You know, there's in gay pulp fiction and the, you know, the early history, there, there are these crazy gay and lesbian novels from the 50s and, you know, that were sold like under the counter at the drugstore, you know, kind of thing. Um, to be able to see how these books are packaged and presented is something you can really only do when you're looking and holding the books themselves. And, um, and so that's, you know, and part of that, you know, that value gets students engaged with the material. Um, so absolutely, I, I love to have students come to special collections and explore materials.